Hi, I'm Sheila Oland, and in my career in investment management, I've learned a lot about behavioral finance. And I know that behavioral finance could give you insights to make better real world decisions. Finance has been like school, academically oriented. You want to be rational, objective, logical, and come up with the right answer. Problem is, the world is actually emotional, subjective, and biased. And there's no one right answer, but alternatives, each with its own uncertainty and risk. And this is where behavioral finance comes in. Behavioral finance has examined these sorts of real-world decision-making environments and how to improve it. Let's look at a case study. This is a letter from So Confused. Dear economist, I'm 25 years old. I have a boyfriend, but I don't really like him that much. <laughs> We've been together a long time. Should I leave him and try to get a better boyfriend? <laughs> well, this is a, a real dilemma. And I think that so confused should get a, a wide selection of advice. Let's start with grandmother's advice. Grandmother's advice. Don't be so picky. <laughs> You're not perfect. He's not perfect. Get on with it. Be real. That's a very pragmatic uh, recommendation. So let's turn to your best girlfriend. Best girlfriend's answer. Oh, you deserve so much better. Now, if you were lucky to have Oprah Winfrey as your best friend, she would say, go live your best life. So we've got two very different uh, advice perspectives. What does an economist tell you? An economist actually can contribute to this. First, with the point of sunk costs. <laughs> sunk costs are those, the time and effort and money that you've put in in the past that you're never going to recover. <laughs> so there's no point in, though, in throwing good money after bad. If you're in a bad relationship, don't just keep going because it's been there in the past. So that's just a waste of the future. And it's also a waste because you have an opportunity cost associated with it. As long as you're in the bad relationship, you're not seeking the opportunity for improvement. So there we have it. The economist comes down on the side of the best girlfriend. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Now, what do we expect to happen? We've got the rational answer, it's all sorted out, what's going to happen? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the reason for that is people don't make decisions on rational basis. They make it on subjective emotional basis. And that's why, as I said, behavioral finance is going to help us. And we're going to look at three aspects of behavioral finance. Anchoring, availability, and hyperbolic loss aversion. And we're going to be graphing this so that it's uh, scientific. We've got a vertical axis of our feelings, <laughs> good, okay, and bad, and a horizontal axis of time. Time zero is now, time one is short term, time two is long term. So it's official. <laughs> now, <laughs> the problem, first behavioral bias that we have is anchoring. Now, anchoring is when we over-rely on basically the first piece of information that we get. We anchor into that first random piece of information we get. Now, this was proven, actually, experimentally by Trusky and Kahneman. And in their experiment, they there was a, a wheel with numbers from 0 to 99. And you first spun the wheel. But if you'd like to play along, think of your telephone number. Think of the last two digits in your telephone number. So you've got the last two digits in your telephone number. Now, answer this question. In the United Nations, what percentage is made up of African nations? Now, in the experiment, it's been proven that whatever random number you generated first, it will influence your answer to a totally unrelated question. So if you had a high number on the wheel, you would guess a high percentage. If you had a low number, you'd guess a low percentage. So now you can think if you were influenced by the random two number digits in your telephone number, 
The correct answer is 28%. Now, does this mean that we're just slaves to the first random event that happens to us? Are we anchored into whatever circumstance we find ourselves in? The answer is no. No, once you realize this tendency, you can think about it, you can make other decisions. And uh, a case in point, I use my uh, husband's grandfather. He was born in Sweden, in the Arctic Circle. Now we know that the Arctic Circle is extremely cold, and he found that he was spending his entire life trying to keep warm. In the summer, he would cut down trees. In the winter, he would transport the logs and burn the wood. He decided that although he was anchored and started off that way, that wasn't how he wanted to spend his life. So he moved to sunny California, and he used his carpentry skills to participate in the California real estate boom. So it when, because we're aware of our bias does, uh, can help us actually uh, surmount it. So now we're all ready to go off and not be tied down. We're going to move out of our status quo, go and explore and clear sailing. Actually, no. We're about to encounter our second behavioral bias. And that's availability. Now, availability is a tendency to latch on to the most accessible uh, information that you have. And that's usually what's covered in the media. And I'll give you three examples. The first is airlines. When an airline crashes, it's very unfortunate, but it does get a high coverage in the news media. And there's a lot of people who are very afraid to fly. But they have no concern about getting in a car and driving around when, in fact, it's auto traffic that's most likely to be the source of accidents. Lotteries are a second example. You have a very small probability of winning the lottery. I hope that's not a surprise. Um, but the winners are advertised extensively. And so you start to think, ah, oh, he won. Well, I could win. And you, you latch on to what's the fact that you see a winner, then it must be easier than, than, than you think. The third, though, is relates specifically to relationships, because there's a, an availability bias that is unique to relationships. And it starts as a very young children, we all learn fairy tales. Prince Charming is going to go and find Cinderella. He's got a silver slipper. He's r scourging the kingdom, trying to find her. We got that idea, and that's the romantic notion that we live with. Because once we outgrow um, fairy tales, we've got a whole slew of romantic li literature. And in romantic literature, I'll summarize it for you. Mr. Darcy, aristocratic, wealthy, handsome Mr. Darcy, uh, doesn't seem to get along very well with Elizabeth. They seem to fight all the time. But we know that by the end of the movie or film or book that they will get married and live happily ever after. There's some elements of, of unreality in this story, just like thinking that you're going to win the lottery. So you don't, you don't want to base your analysis and decisions on this overly available information. So now that you've, got, uh, you've sorted out that, okay, Prince Charming isn't going to come and find me with, a, with a, my slipper, uh, the reality is you're going to have to go out and make some effort, some effort, to find him. Now, the problem is that this involves a loss. The first loss you have is you're out of your uh, status quo, you're out of your comfort zone. You've lost your, your comfort zone, and that's painful. And the second, or many losses thereafter, is this climbing up to find him, all the different trials that you'll have to go through to find him. And that brings us to the hyperbolic loss aversion. Hyperbolic loss aversion tells you that you feel much more pain for losing $100, for example, then you feel pleasure for gaining $100. Now, I'll give you a, an example. Let's say you go shopping and you, so during the sales, and you find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, it's on sale, so it's not refundable, but okay. You spend $100, you get something, it, you take it home, it's great, good, works fine. Alternatively, you spend the $100, as soon as you take it out of the store, it falls apart. It's a complete piece of junk. Uh, how are you going to feel? You're going to feel very mad. Who could have made this piece of junk? Well, how could that store have sold me this piece of junk? 
but most especially, how could I have been so stupid to have bought this piece of junk? There's more pain associated with the $100 loss than you felt with the $100 gain. And that goes across a wide gamut of, of situations. But why do you feel so much more pain with the same loss? It's because you scold yourself and you, you belittle yourself. And you need to sort of interrupt that internal dialogue because inevitably there's going to be losses. And it's going to be a struggle. Almost anything you do will involve multiple losses. And this is where probability is going to help us. What are the chances? Now, I'll just tell you the statistics. If your expected success rate is 10%, to have a 90% chance of at least one success, you'll have to go on 20 trials. What does that mean? This is used in sales. So if a salesperson has uh, an expected 10% success rate, they'll have, to do at l they'll have to do 20 trials, 20 sales calls, to uh, have a 90% uh, success rate. If you're going on a job interview and you have a 10% chance of being hired, you're likely to get a 90% chance of, of at least once because you go on 20 job interviews. College applications. If you have a 10% uh, chance of getting into a college, you'd have to do 20 applications. Now, you can try to improve your odds. So, for example, you could try to say, instead of 10%, I'm going to go with more selection, better, cr uh, better qu qualifications, I'll get a 25% odds. Still, that means you've got to go on eight trials. B more than you expect. Even if you've got a 50-50 chance to get the 90% uh, uh, likelihood, you've got three trials. So the, the point that uh, probability tells us is it's going to take more than you expect to uh, reach your goal. And um, going back to relationships, uh, if, you know, so confused, while well, she's trying to find Mr. Right, how many first dates is she going to have to go on to find Mr. Right? Now, we call it first date, but most of these are going to be actually more better, quali better described as first and last dates. But people don't say first and last dates. People say disaster. As in, last night's date was a train wreck of a disaster. <laughs> because you feel a lot of pain when you go through every single trial. Now, I think the pain is accentuated because you've got all this romantic propaganda setting your expectations at this level, and the reality is somewhat less. And we know that hyperbolic loss aversion will take that loss and multiply the pain. So it's a painful experience. And it's not just once, but twice, and three times, and four times. And what statistics has so helpfully told us is that we could be on, on disaster date 16, and we're still, we're still on course for success. But by then, you're going to start feeling very discouraged. Poor, so confused is going to be so discouraged. Uh, and what, what's, what's to do? What can you do? And I think at that point, you need to interrupt the mental dialogue that you have. And instead of uh, saying, you know, it's all hopeless, it's never going to work, I'm hopeless, forget about it, go back to your grandmother. You're not perfect, the world's not perfect, get on with it. Think about successful entrepreneurs, and successful entrepreneurs often say, I failed my way to success. But what behavioral finance tells you is that this is, this is what happens. And even though you're out of your comfort zone, you, you would love to be anchored back to the status quo, your availability bias has got you all sorts of wrong information, and you're feeling really bad every time you have a loss, just knowing that can assure you that you're really on course to success. Now, literature actually tells a similar story. Let's look at the classic story arc. In the beginning, we have the hero. The hero is forced out of his status quo for some reason. He makes a plan. Now, we know the plan is going to be fa fatally flawed because he will have used his availability bias instead of getting good information. We go on to the middle of the story. Our poor hero is overcoming obstacles and difficulties that rise until a crisis. Now, all of those painful losses are going to be multiplied 
uh, and we're going to see the hyperbolic loss aversion take its toll. But finally, our hero will perhaps develop a new plan with better information and finally achieve his success. And I think the insight that literature tells us is that it's not just getting from A to B. It's not just achieving your goal. But in that process, the hero is transformed. So when we think about, in conclusion, how does behavioral finance help us? It helps us first by giving insights to make better decisions. Second, it gives us the confidence to persevere to achieve our goals. And finally, through this process, it gives us the opportunity to be transformed. Thank you.